Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Back in 1953, it was reported that Charlie Wilson, then the head of General Motors, said that what's good for General Motors was good for America. While that quote is a bit apocryphal, the idea it presented was real. The notion that the success of any particular business was tied up with the success of the nation. In the 50s, it was said of General Motors. In the 70s, it might have been said of Exxon. But today, it might be said of Amazon. The company has changed the way we shop, not insignificant in a nation where retail accounts for 6% of our GDP and 25% of our employment. It changed the way we think about the cloud, about privacy, about electronic storage, and now even transportation, and soon to be some aspects of healthcare. How did one company become so powerful and so successful, not in one, but in multiple areas, in such a relatively short time? The answer lies in understanding Amazon's visionary founder, Jeff Bezos. Currently the richest man in the world, the money shouldn't obscure the vision, his talents, and his place in the Founder CEO Hall of Fame. Few understand Bezos better than my guest Brad Stone. Brad Stone is a senior executive editor at Global Technology at Bloomberg. He is the author of the previous New York Times bestseller, The Everything Store, and he has covered Silicon Valley for more than 20 years. It is my pleasure to welcome Brad Stone back to this program to talk about his new work, Amazon Unbound, Jeff Bezos and the Invention of a Global Empire. Brad Stone, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Jeff. Thank you. Well, it's great to have you here. Your first book, In the Everything Store, you looked at the first 15 years of the evolution of of Amazon, and and, and this book, Amazon Unbound, looks at at the, the period after that. Talk about the ways in which the evolution of the company shaped Bezos and and the way in which Bezos and and his changes shaped the evolution of the company, the way those things have worked hand in hand over time. Right. They're they're very much indistinguishable. And it's why both books kind of function both as biographies of the of the man and the company. Uh, Bezos really set the pace for Amazon early on. Uh, Folks probably remember it starts as an online bookseller, but he views one of the greatest enemies uh, to companies and even to society as stagnation. And he tells his, his colleagues, bring me new things. He wants to see plans for expansion, ambition, and invention in all of their uh, operating plans for the years ahead. And when they don't bring it to him, he gets impatient. The bookseller becomes the, the broader e-commerce uh, company, online retailer. That's why they spawn a marketplace. They start developing things like Prime, the Kindle, and the Cloud. So his relentlessness really spurs the company into this ongoing expansion. Um, we're speaking in a month when Amazon opened a hair salon in London, Jeff, right? Like of all the things, of all the representations of how far this company has gone. Uh, but then we flip over the coin and you talk about the company impacting the man. And certainly like, this is the story I'm telling on Amazon Unbound. He's, he's worth now more than $200 billion. He has a spot on the global stage. His public image is sort of battered by the sense that Amazon treats its employees harshly, that it's a monopolist. Uh, He doesn't really seem to mind that. He's kind of prancing about on on the world stage now, enjoying the extravagant luxuries of his wealth. I report in the book that he's building this massive yacht. So I think it really has changed him, right? He's going to space. So it's, it's given him the opportunity to do a lot of things. When one looks at the core business, there seems to be a, a consistent theme that, that runs through a lot of it. Not all of it, certainly not something like a hair salon in London, but this idea of taking what might be liabilities, what might be costs, and turning them into assets and new business. If he was selling books, he could sell everything. If they needed cloud storage in order to sell everything, they could turn that into a profit center. This idea that they were able to take parts of the business that might be liabilities and turn them into profit-making assets. Talk about that. Yeah, I think part of that springs from necessity. Um, People remember the way in which Wall Street kind of counted Amazon out for many years after the dot-com bust in the year 2000. Its stock price was in the doldrums for years. eBay was valued more highly. And I think it breeded a kind of maybe desperate resourcefulness 
for Amazon, where they kind of had to figure out what to do next, that maybe they had selected the least inspiring business model of the new age. And so, you know, you go back to 2004, 2005, and Bezos is looking for ways to improve the financial performance of the company. And it leads to things like Prime. Um, they had made advancements in their warehouse as well. Could they use that to promise faster delivery? And of course, that helps boost the business. And now, you know, over 200 million Prime members worldwide. Or you mentioned the cloud business. They had developed this expertise in their data centers. Could they turn around and sell that? So part of it sprang from a kind of desperation. And now I just think it's sort of the MO of the company. You know, what, what can they do uh, that they can turn around and kind of operationalize? Uh, a good example these days is the supermarkets that they're developing. Um, Amazon, they're called Amazon Fresh, not Whole Foods, but um, supermarkets with lower prices and broader selection. Well, it's Amazon, so it's not, it's not just a plain old supermarket. They're using the AI uh, technology they've developed in other parts of the business, um, putting face, facial recognition in the stores and allowing customers to pass the, the cashier line. So, yeah, very, very much. I have a quote from Bezos. It's actually in the Everything Store. We don't have many big advantages, so we have to weave a rope of our, of our smaller advantages, and I think that's what he does. Talk a little bit about the culture of the company, the way the culture has evolved, and the way it reflects Bezos in so many ways. Sure. It, it won't be a surprise uh, to people listening that this is a famously difficult culture. I, you, you often have to separate the, the warehouse culture from the office culture, but let's speak in generalities. Employees are measured. Their performance is closely monitored. If they're falling behind, they're put on performance improvement plans. There's a constant kind of allegation, which Amazon sort of contests, but I think broadly it's true that they try to push a certain percentage of employees out the door. Um, Jeff Bezos had this, had this feeling, and I, I quote some former HR people in the book as recalling him saying it, that the, the greatest danger to Amazon was an entrenched and disgruntled workforce. So we all know those colleagues who have stuck around for too long and who have lost their motivation, have lost their verb, and he devised systems to push those people out and to constantly hire new people. So I think there's a sense that this culture can be kind of cruel, you know, can be sort of transactional, um, that Amazon doesn't want to sit there and mint millionaires with its growing stock price because they, then they'd get fat and happy and wouldn't keep working. So that is responsible for a lot of the accounts, I think, that people read and hear about and that I write about in my books of this being a typical place to work. And in that sense, Amazon is a little bit different than some of the Silicon Valley culture in, in, in the cushiness of it in, in Silicon Valley versus Amazon, the idea of you know free food, free perks that we hear so much about. That's not part of the Amazon culture. No, that's right. I mean, there's this there's this corporate value of frugality um, that stems from I think it's it's beginning as a retailer that it really couldn't pamper employees or allow everyone to fly business class because that would show up in higher prices for customers. But I think the bigger difference these days is that in Silicon Valley, I think there's a permissiveness about political views and internal dissent. And you see it at Google and to some extent at Apple, um, at Facebook, where employees are banding together and demanding changes and protesting some elements of their office experience. And Amazon fires the whistleblowers, or at least it has historically and did during the pandemic. And it, it's one of the I really, frankly, most sort of unappealing aspects of the culture. You know, we've seen it again and again, employees agitating for change in its climate record uh, in the way it treats its warehouse workers and its safety disclosures during the pandemic. And Amazon found reasons to fire those employees. It kind of brooks no internal dissent. And I think companies like Google and Facebook perhaps feel more of a responsibility to engage in a dialogue with their employees. And does that come from Bezos? I think so. I think so. I, I Look, he... <laughs> It, but a lot, a lot of the companies springs from Bezos. I, I describe it as scaffolding built around his brain. To some extent, I think it's scaffolding built around his personality. And there's m many genius aspects to him, but also a kind of ruthlessness. And I feel like maybe a lack of empathy. And he always, and he, he can see things. He can see systems, not necessarily people. And I think that he, he sort of realizes. And look, I mean, frankly, there's a point. I mean. Some of the agitation at, for example, Google over diversity and, and uh, representation and, 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 and um, the ethical values of their artificial intelligence systems 
have, you know, the company has pulled out of government contracts, for example. Well, Amazon, Bezos is just sort of like unwilling to have that conversation. He says, we're going to do it. And it's been good for business. Uh, and yet, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's a little heartless in the way in which he, he's, the company has just not listened to some of, the, uh, some of the loud voices within its employee ranks. One of the best examples, I suppose, of, of that sort of systemic approach or to think everything can be a system is how he originally looked upon the entertainment business and Hollywood as if he could write out just a list of things that every piece of entertainment needs to have. And if you just did this the way I say, it'll all work out. Yeah, I kind of love that example. So in, in Amazon Unbound, I have a chapter about Amazon's expansion into Hollywood. And one of the things that Bezos couldn't didn't understand about Hollywood is why the hit rate was so low, why, you know, half or more of all TV shows and movies kind of bombed or underperformed. Well, he thought, well, we'll, we'll just science it. And, and he, actually, the, the first name of the Amazon Studios was the Scientific Studio. And they thought they could create big online, like, focus groups and, and focus group, everything from whether a pilot should be picked up to a casting decision. Well, I mean, that's not really how creativity works, right? I mean, famously, the first season of Seinfeld didn't do well, but then it became a classic, same with shows like Breaking Bad. And so, you know, and, and then creative people really don't want to be focus grouped in that way. So they had to evolve, right? And, and I think actually there was a learning curve there that there's probably still on uh, the, the, you know, the, the science guys figuring out, okay, how does creativity work? It's really not a formula. You know, there's a magic to it. Talk a little bit about how the company grew in terms of investors and, and the willingness of investors and of Wall Street to give Bezos the runway that he had to build the company. And, and to what extent is Amazon still dealing with that? To what extent is it still part of, of the financial culture and the corporate culture of the company? Wall Street's permissiveness was was crucial in, in the early years, and, and it goes back to the shareholder letter that Bezos wrote in 1997, and you know, said, telling them how he's going to run the company with a long term perspective and and not for you know quarterly profit. And that was um, was punished for many years, but essentially Bezos, you know, he he has the magic of the founder. He was right so many times. You know, flash forward to 2020, Amazon was had the most profitable year in its history. Um, I, I don't think it sort of relies on the permissiveness of Wall Street anymore. It's fundamentally profitable. The big question will be when he, you know, he's leaving the CEO chair, Andy Jassy takes over, how much of the halo of the founder goes to Jassy? If he has a bad quarter, does Wall Street put up with it? You know, they, they when it's happened in the past, Analysts say, well, Jeff Bezos is investing, right? It's all part of the next phase of growth. And Amazon stock price can take a hit, but really hasn't gone that far down. And does the same thing happen, or does Jassy need to prove himself? He's He's been a great operator in AWS, but he doesn't have the magic of the founder, and he hasn't been so historically right about things in the past, um, as Bezos was about cloud computing and the Kindle and Alexa. So it'll be interesting to see how much leeway he gets from Wall Street. Well, one of the interesting things about that, and it was sort of why I brought up this whole idea of how he approached the entertainment business, because in many ways, he operates the same way. He operates in a way that, that is exactly the way that Hollywood operates, in that he had hits like like the Kindle, like Alexa, but he also had cow burgers and uh, the fire stick and a lot of things that were failures along the way. Right. Um, I love the story of the single cow burger. And I'll just, Jeff, I'll just tell it really quickly. He, he, reads a, he reads a story in the Washington Post saying that a, a normal hamburger is made with the meat of hundreds of cows, which is unappetizing. And he decides that creating a, a, a burger from a single cow would be a game changer for Amazon Fresh. And he kind of micromanages it through the process, taste tests it, sends it back for revisions. And it comes out, doesn't, doesn't do very much. But it, the story is instructive in a number of ways. One, how, how he will really guide new things at Amazon um, and take an interest in them. But yeah, too, how there's a, maybe a tolerance for just trying things. We mentioned the hair salon earlier in the chat. like. They, 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 they seem to yeah, have more of a per, permissiveness for the belly slot, particularly when Bezos is involved, right? He, uh, unsurprisingly, they don't mind this. Fire phone, right, a, a famous sort of flop, and they moved on quickly. So, you know, they don't, yeah, it's a company that doesn't seem to mind the kind of public embarrassment, and then they quickly move on. 
And talk about Blue Origin and how that fits into the equation, because that's moved rather slowly by Bezos standards. Right. Yeah. So Blue Origin is the is the private space company that that he started back in 2000. Um, there was a sense there that he would fund it himself, that he would keep the headcount small, but that the goal was to open up this ecosystem of, of entrepreneurship in space. And he imagined going into orbit and going to the moon, but starting out with kind of suborbital tourism flights. And they were going to go step by step. And then this little company called SpaceX comes along, founded by Elon Musk, starts two years later, and basically starts to run laps, or I guess kind of orbit, run orbits around uh, Blue Origin. And they're, they get the government to pay for their progress in terms of satellite launches and trips to the ISS and, and beyond. And, and so Blue Origin has been playing catch up. Uh, Bezos is taking the first suborbital flight now 21 years after he started the company in late July. Um, they've got a lot of work. They've got a lot to prove. They haven't accomplished much, and he's spent billions of dollars. So it's an extraordinary kind of story, right? In his empire of accomplishment, there isn't much that hasn't worked. And Blue Origin, I would argue, there's a little bit of dysfunction there. He hasn't really spent a lot of time there. He's managed it from afar. He's lavished it with, with resources. He, but he's changed to the kind of operating rhythms of the company from afar several different times. And um, it'll be interesting to see how much time he spends there now, now that he's no longer CEO of Amazon. And I'm sure it, it galls him when, when Elon Musk says, well, I'm just a better engineer than he is. Uh, Elon loves to take shots at Bezos. Um, it's extremely entertaining to watch. The, their, pers their different personalities are on display. It must can kind of speak from the cuff. He's undisciplined in his tweets. He's vastly more entertaining. Um, and he turns his followers into fans. And Bezos is much more disciplined than careful. And people tend to be skeptical of him, in part maybe because Amazon is seen as a retailer and maybe some, somewhat of a monopolist whereas Elon is seen as uh, this pioneer of an energy future with Tesla. And so it's interesting, and, and Bezos certainly uh, is, seems to be on the losing end of that battle, at least for now. One of the things that's so interesting, you spend a lot of time talking about how disciplined he is and how structured the company is, et cetera, as, you, as you've alluded to, and yet there are things that happen like HQ2 where the discipline breaks down and it just goes with, with Bezos's gut. Yeah, so I have a chapter on HQ2 in the book. It was extremely revealing as I as I kind of plunged into it. Um, you know, long, one of the one of the long story short, the HQ2 team, after endless deliberation and visits to all the 20 finalists, they had settled on Raleigh, Philadelphia, and Chicago as the finalists. And then, as you're alluding to, the S team changed course and ultimately decided to split it up between New York City and Northern Virginia. And of course, folks remember what happened in, in New York City or Queens. Um, it wasn't necessarily gut. It might have partly been gut, but partly it was the landscape had changed so much. They were kind of getting drummed out of Seattle. Bezos was limit, limiting the growth there and was having grown. It was a misunderstanding of the political environment, certainly in New, New York. Um, and then, and then, yes, arguably, it was where Bezos wanted to go. He has homes in both places. So uh, it, it, it's interesting, but it was really a representation of how bad, how, how starkly the political environment around big tech companies had shifted and how little Amazon understood from its kind of cloistered bubble, uh, you know, in, in their success and in Seattle about uh, what, what, they were, what they were facing in New York. To what extent do you think Bezos understands the climate now, the political and cultural climate with respect to Amazon, both positive and negative? Oh, I think they fully understand. Well, they, they have a much greater appreciation for it. If you look at the last Bezos letter to investors that came out, I think, in April, it was a, an impassioned kind of defense of Amazon as a uh, contributor and not an extractor of value to society, to employees. Um, Bezos talked about creating value for shareholders. I, it was definitely a defense of his own wealth. Um, you know, he, he he made a vow to be the Earth's best employer. Big, big change from uh, the, the customer-focused or obsessed uh, position of the past. 
I think they realize now that they have a number of constituencies, not just customers, um, but society, their communities, their employees, and that they've really, their public image has suffered because they haven't paid enough attention to, to those other parties. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and now we're entering into a period of intense antitrust scrutiny, um, and they know they're going to have to defend themselves. I write in the book about how they're reading up on previous companies like the AMT supermarket chain and how they fared in antitrust uh, circumstances. So I think there's a under, understanding there that um, that they are, uh, you know, they have some work to do here to kind of justify their success. Is there concern or does Bezos have concern that by so much focus of the company on potential antitrust issues and, and fighting the government and fighting all of these, these forces that are allied against them, that it will have an impact on the growth of the company, much as it did with respect to Microsoft, where it really forced the company, arguably, to take its eye off the ball for so many years. I don't, I don't know about that one. I feel like, if anything, I'm sensing, you know, maybe a little bit of, I want to say arrogance, but a feeling like they're going to let the situation play out, um, that um, the facts are on their side. This is, you know, at least what they think. Um, you know, they're going to lean into some changes, uh, at, le at least if they impact the entire industry. I'll give you an example. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of attention on private labels. And there are bills, some of these bills will say that, you know, a platform or retailer shouldn't be competing with its own uh, with its own with its own partners or brands and and so I think if Amazon you know sees that impacting all of retail well look you've got a Costco or a Walmart or a Walgreens with a great percentage of their products are 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 house made um, and so they'll lean in the changes as long as they're broadly impacted and if if that's the case and I'm sure the courts would in, enforce that kind of fairness then Amazon will be fine so I don't I don't I'm not sensing any panic from the company but I think they want to lead with their chin and and not do what Microsoft did in the 90s which is be a kind of pugilistic antagonist in this process they're going to try to be humble um, and, and they're going to try to, um, you know, just sort of lobby behind the scenes for changes that are broadly applied. And to what extent do you think that Bezos moving up into this position of, of executive chair or whatever it is, is going to impact the company? I will, I'm going to say in the short term, not as much, and in the long term, uh, um, it, it will. The story that I'm telling in the book is of Bezos stepping away from Amazon. He uh, he has allowed his deputies to run the big businesses, AWS and retail and transportation and Alexa, with with more and more autonomy over the years, swooping in occasionally, but by and large spending his time focused on the new things as he was wildly distracted by his personal saga and everything that was happening with Trump and his philanthropy, et cetera. And so in the short term, as he becomes executive chairman, not a lot changes. I think Jassy becomes the more visible figurehead um, and that and that Bezos will kind of gradually, you know, restrict his activities to um, the board meetings and to, and to nurturing new products. So, you know, by and large, a, a change, but perhaps probably not a big one. He'll still be the loudest voice in the executive meeting room. But I do think we see over the, over the next couple of years him really pulling away sailing the high seas in that fantastic yacht he's building, uh, working on philanthropy, doing who knows, you know, going, going to space, building, reapplying himself to Blue Origin. And that will have a significant impact on Amazon. You know, the founder with all of his magic is really going to move away. And this, the story I tell in the book of initiatives like Alexa and the ghost store, um, even Prime Day, Prime Day wouldn't have happened if employees inside of Amazon didn't you know they everyone was reluctant so it's like well why why do we want to work so hard in in the summer as we're preparing for the peak season of the of the holidays and you know all people had to say was well this is a jeff project and they ran around like panicked ants uh to get it done because it's a jeff project so if you don't have that I don't think it's an Andy project conveys the same uh, uh severity so I think they'll lose that they'll lose a little bit of urgency and um, that would be a risk for, for Amazon, for sure. The fact that the company may solidify and, and grow slower as a result of not as many new areas, to, to what extent is that a concern to people inside Amazon that really rely on the stock price in terms of their potential compensation? Well, um, look, I mean, I think a stagnating stock price is, is, a, is a risk 
uh, to Amazon. The and compensation is so um, intensely um, uh, stock-based, equity-based. Um, yeah, so so that's a risk. Turn, high turnover is a risk. Amazon always has an, a little bit of a high high turnover in its ranks. Um, and so, um, yeah, but but like you, when you talk about new areas, I think that they do have their eye on new areas. There's healthcare, um, and there's um, there's a satellite network they want to launch to provide internet access. It's called Project Kuiper in competition with Starlink. Uh, they've got the online pharmacy and all the healthcare stuff I just mentioned, rob robotics initiatives. So there's plenty of new things that could move the stock price. And then, of course, there's plenty of room to grow in cloud computing and um, and, and retail overall. Uh, but, yes, a stagnating stock price is kryptonite to Amazon and even other tech companies where compensation is very much equity-based. And finally, when, when Bezos steps away, when he goes into space, sails on this incredible yacht for a while and everything else, and gets bored with all of that, what do you think is next for him from, from a business perspective? Is it back at Amazon? Is it something new? Is it Jeff Bezos 3.0? What happens? You know, I, I want to be hopeful here and, 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 and say that he's going to apply himself to philanthropy. He, he now has a $200 billion fortune to give away. He created the Bezos Earth Fund and seems to understand that climate change really does pose an existential threat to, to humanity. Um, I hope he's going to get more involved in that and use his, his, his kind of talent for invention um, and to, for spotting exciting companies to make a difference there. But, I mean, the fact that he's building this yacht, the fact that he does seem now with his new partner to so enjoy the, that life of luxury and wealth, yeah, I think we're, we're going to see him enjoying himself as, as he continues to kind of start new, new products at Amazon, work on Blue Origin, need to, to operate the Washington Post, I, you know, he'll be a busy guy spreading himself uh, along a lot of uh, responsibilities. Brad Stone, the book is Amazon Unbound, Jeff Bezos and the Invention of a Global Empire. Brad, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.